Tens of thousands of people once more took to the streets of Dublin in the ongoing protests against the government's doomed water charges. The footage you're looking at here shows just the section of the march that started off at Houston Station. It hasn't yet met up with the section of the march coming from Connolly Station, and of course some of the Dublin groups took a more direct route directly to the rally at O'Connell Street. The campaign against the water charges is the most widespread and powerful grassroots movement in recent Irish history. With hundreds of local campaign groups, daily direct actions and five national demonstrations of the order of 50 to 100,000 people, the cynical refrain that the Irish don't protest has rapidly been replaced by a sense of ubiquitous rebellion. Irish water is a depraved neoliberal world in effigy, embodying many of the worst problems of our society, including the rule of international finance and private greed in general, at the cost of the vast majority's well-being and the chronic disconnection of the populace from decision-making. As such, the movement has become a platform for opposition to austerity, the bank bailout, privatisation, the government, party politics, the European Union and much more. Thousands of people have experienced a political reawakening, but while it is possible that we will win this battle and abol abolish Irish water, this struggle represents a precious opportunity to make a grassroots offensive after so many years of being beaten down. It certainly wasn't always obvious that the fight against the water charges would be so enormous. The sheer turnout on the 11th of October right to water demonstration, not to mention that protesters came from all over the country, came as a surprise to most people, including much of the activists left. That day definitively established in people's minds that not only was there a serious nationwide fight back, but that we could probably win. The mood was of defiance, confidence and the joy of revolting together. But people didn't throng Dublin city centre out of nowhere. After the collapse of the campaign against house and water taxes in around January of 2014, a small number of people decided to stay active and stop the installation of water meters, for, ans for instance in Ballyperine and Toher in Cork, and then a few areas of North East Dublin. On this, Gregor Kerr, who was Secretary of the Federation of Dublin Anti-Water anti Charges campaigns in the 1990s, opinioned, I don't think it's any exaggeration to say that the huge protest on 11th October wouldn't have been anything like the size it was without the slow burn for the previous months of blockades and protests against meter installations spreading from community to community. And it was no coincidence either that many of the people involved in water meter blockades had also participated earlier in the summer in blockades of scab-operated bin trucks in their communities in support of the locked-out greyhound workers. The initiative and hard work of these early campaigns was the germ of the huge movement which has burgeoned since. The purpose of Irish water is certainly not safeguarding your water for your future, as they like to claim. Only the most naive would believe that the same kind of career politicians who decided to critically underfund a water infrastructure over decades, so that 40-50% to 50 of supply in leaked and whole areas on boil notices, are suddenly driven to make long-term, tough decisions for the good of humanity. Furthermore, these are the same politicians who are committed to ignoring the very present catastrophe of climate change, which not only threatens the volume and quality of usable water nationally, but also globally. Indeed, Irish water has been established to transform our water into a commodity, an, an economic object bought and sold in a market that will be owned and controlled by private interests. Even former Fine Gael junior minister Fergus O'Dowd, not quite an, anarcho an anarcho-communist, spoke of being deeply concerned at other agendas they may be European and not knowing where they are coming from when he was involved in the foundation of Irish water. But this is not peculiar to Ireland. The global pattern is that familiar megabanks and investing powerhouses such as Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Chase, Citigroup, UBS, Deutsche Bank, Credit Suisse are consolidating their control over water. The UN has predicted there will be a 40% shortfall in global water supply by 2030. In 2008, Goldman Sachs called water the petroleum for the next century. Such corporations have been slurping up water utilities, reserves and anything else related. For example, in 2012, Goldman Sachs bought Viola Water, which is the largest water services corporation on the planet and already has operations in Ireland. There are a handful of multinational corporations which dominate the global water market. If you can't trust supposedly accountable politicians to manage water supplies for the common good, you definitely can't trust an entirely unaccountable corporation to do so. But further still, this issue is part of a political trajectory which is even older and goes far beyond the shores of Ireland, that is, neoliberalism. Neoliberalism in theory is the idea that, in order to maximise the liberty of the individual, the state should interfere with the personal affairs and economic transactions as little as possible, 
merely ensuring the conditions for private property to exist through law and order, and the conditions of trade by prosecuting fraud. Everything should be a commodity and have a price tag, so that it is used in an efficient manner, and all companies should be privately owned and operated for the same reason. Hence, neoliberal capitalist policies include privatisation, deregulation, removing tariffs and austerity. However, in practice, neoliberalism is far messier and really involves removing state interference in ways that suit the elite the most and applying state force in ways that suit the elite the most. And we've seen that in housing estates all over the country as the Garda impose water meters. As such, neoliberalism is radically opposed to the commons. The idea that, for instance, water is a human right, not a commodity, and should be available to all according to need. Or that land, or indeed accommodation, vehicles, clothing and food are held in common. Pleas from professional compromises in politics and media to ensure that Irish water remains in public ownership are a diversion from the fact that Irish water exists in order to be privatised. A referendum on state ownership, different to public, communal etc. ownership, would merely leave the utility in the hands of the same shower who are currently ramming the water charges through. The time-tested method of defunding the infrastructure and waiting for the private sector to save us from state inefficiency would be applied. Not only that, but EU law and commercial monopolies would require the water market be open to comp competition, not to mention the impeding transatlantic trade and investment partnership tips. Irish water must be abolished. Resistance to the Irish water plan has been relentless. The movement has not withered away as the establishment hoped or expected, even in the face of guarded repression and mainstream media denunciation. The, there is the sense that there is always some action going on somewhere and that protest or dissent in general has become sort of a national pastime. Another sign of the times is the record distrust of politicians, the judiciary, the Garda and the mainstream media and big business. The Irish water story has provided ample opportunity for various parts of the system to expose their true nature. This is especially true in the case of the Garda, who have enjoyed a reputation of being peacekeepers among most of the population for, mo for many years. But people who have blocked water meters from being installed have discovered another reality. To many, the Garda are like an occupying army. There is no lesson quite like being arrested, and thanks to social media, this lesson has been shared the length and breadth of the country. A ludicrously excessive Garda presence is a familiar sight to anyone following the anti-water charges movement, with packs of Garda crowding around a few meter holes as if protecting someone from murder. The Jobstown Dawn raids, the pepper spraying of protesters in Kulak, and the jailing of four injuncted protesters only make it harder to swallow the idea that the Garda and judiciary exist to serve the people rather than the interests of an elite. Within the water charges movement, the mainstream media has come to be seen as couriers for government propaganda. Attendance at protests is persistently underreported, and the movement has been hounded by the has protests gone too far narrative, sometimes using outright fabrications. We've been able to subvert this by forming our own counter media, which has played an important role. A sprawling network of Facebook pages, Twitter accounts, and a host of blogs and other websites provides a means to communicate quickly amongst ourselves. Solidarity Times is part of that initiative. With this, we keep up to date on activity around the country, digest and react to establishment spin, discuss tactics, and more. The grassroots media network has been giving staying power to the movement, allowing protesters who would be otherwise isolated and forgotten to link with and inspire others. At the heart of this movement is direct action, both in the prevention of meter installations and the boycott of bills. Dedication to the former has been impressive, with people regularly waking at 5, 6 and 7 in the morning to protest for hours on end, often in quite stressful circumstances. These protests can have almost military precision, scouting for meter contractors each day, communicating their movements via text trees. This is typified by, for example, Dublin's Flying Column, who responded rapidly to alerts and drive to different parts of the city, and the Cove County Court Group, who even have a makeshift command and control centre. If anything, this movement is a testament to the ability of so-called ordinary people to figure out things for themselves and organise effectively. But despite the spontaneity, ingenuity and grassroots nature of this movement, most of the left are still hell-bent on the tired strategy of electoralism. There is much talk of left alliances, broad platforms and progressive coalitions. In other words, another attempt at failed social democracy. It appears that along with the economic crisis, we have a crisis of imagination. Elections are where movements go to die, demobilising people and fostering divisions. Why bother taking action yourself when some politicians are going to solve the problem for us? 
And who are going to do the campaigning for these anti-water charges candidates? Well, water protesters, of course. Postering, leafleting, canvassing, organising meetings. All of this effort and time and money and hope will be poured into what is ultimately a ritual mass delusion rather than critical grassroots activity. We desperately require a fundamental transformation of society and this cannot come from the building of Parliament. It can only come from the great mass of people taking charge of their destinies and organising direct democratically. Even if the fight against the water charges were to end tomorrow, this struggle has caused significant change in this country, which will have long-term effects. There are so many people who have become politicised and have risen up and will not be content to go home and be quiet. The distrust in establishment institutions won't suddenly evaporate. We've gotten a taste of what real democracy involves, felt our own power, and we like it. What is necessary now is to press on, try to get more people involved, and get more organised. For instance, Alan Kelly has said that non-payers will be bundled into court and we need to ensure the National Defence Fund is large enough to cover that possibility. Most of all, we need to cling to what we have already seen to be true. This is our movement and our world, not a politician's, and if we want to make change, we will have to take responsibility ourselves rather than relying on somebody else. Once more, there was a real sense of power on the streets of Dublin today, the power we have collectively when tens of thousands of us take to the streets. It's quite clear that we can defeat this water charge. But what we need to do is go beyond this. We need to decide how we are going to defeat the neoliberal nightmare the government are seeking to impose on us, and not just our government, but all the governments globally. We need to work out together how we can come together and build a better world. Reporting for Solidarity Times, if you're not doing so already, give us a follow on Facebook. Keep in contact. See you on the streets. Everybody.